<laughs> Welcome to uh, the Gift of Health the weekly wellness chat. Uh, we are, for those of you who do not know, I'm Dr. Arjun Raipudi, and this is my lovely wife, Dr. Shobha Raipudi. We're both lifestyle medicine doctors at Gift of Health. We are dedicated to helping you to prevent and reverse disease and help you get off medications and uh, uh, lose weight and keep it off and enjoy enjoy life with food as medicine. Yeah. Yes. Every week we bring a special guest, but today's guest doesn't need much introduction. But for those of you who are meeting our guest for first time, so I would like to say like uh, Dr. Carlville Esselstein is a star, not only um, in Folks Overnight's so documentary movie, but I like we see him as a real hero, hero. and um, and also he has uh, many accolades. I would say uh, so. One is like he also won Olympic gold medal for a U.S. rowing team, and uh, he is a surgeon. But despite being a surgeon, he has done groundbreaking work in uh, preventing and uh, reversing heart disease. Yes, and, and he's been one of the best doctors in US for many, many years. He's been the, the, the main uh, leader, uh, head of the US uh, Breast Cancer Prevention Task Force. We can keep going on about his accolades. And uh, he's with the author of uh, Prevent and, and reverse. reverse Heart Disease. Yes. And uh, his he and his wife has uh, like so, a, so Anne yeah Anne and so, Jane has actually written the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease cookbook, cookbook yeah. which is always uh, I I would say it's uh, it's in our shelves. Yes. So this is a book to keep. <laughs> yes, Doctor uh, Esselstyn, you are our hero, and we are so so excited to have you on the Gift of Health uh, Weekly Wellness Chat. Uh, so, so honored that you, you know, agreed to share this time with the Gift of Health community and to share your um, knowledge uh, and expertise on uh, preventing and reversing heart disease, not just heart disease, any chronic disease with uh, uh, lifestyle uh, and, and diet. Well, Shoba, Arjun, what an absolute honor to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, I, uh, I don't know that I, I've gotten as, as close to Newfoundland as maybe Nova Scotia. <clears throat> and I think that I have an opportunity today to share with you uh, a patient that I treated from Newfoundland. And uh, I, it's a really kind of, I think, a very interesting story and one I would, I'm delighted to share. But what we've got to do in the next hour or so is see if we can't really uh, eliminate cardiovascular disease. And uh, so I'll, since I promised we'd try to get through before midnight, why well, will <laughs> <laughs> So Dr. Assistant, before you get started with, the, with the, all the knowledge sharing presentation, I wanna sh share this brief story of how you have mm -hmm. saved uh, in a huge, uh, uh, how you have saved my dad from having his uh, like chest cut open, like an invasive procedure on the heart. Like this happened uh, uh, six years ago in uh, uh, 2015, my dad was uh, uh, beginning to have shortness of breath for most of his life. My dad struggled with diabetes, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And uh, when he started having shortness of breath, his cardiologist recommended he have an angiogram, the special X-rays of the heart, the, which showed 90% blockages in two out of the three main blood vessels that supply the heart. One cardiologist said he needs to have stents and another cardiologist said he needs to have bypass surgery. These are uh, pretty risky procedures. And um, uh, my dad's heart was in big trouble when he shared the news of his heart vessels being blocked. I felt as though mine had been broken. That was a very challenging time for my family. I've uh, you know, come across Dr. Sistine's work, but here is uh, an, uh, uh, my dad who was told that he needs to have bypass surgery with our stents within a week, uh, actually the same week. And I was trying to convince my dad that, hey dad, like, you know, you could just go with that exercise program, but he was not willing to listen to us. And then I messaged 
uh, Dr. Sister and you like the uh, email. And I was so surprised the same evening you called back, you called my cell phone and the, that, the, that the, the message that I left and we conversed over the phone for over six minutes. We were actually, I still remember that day because we were visiting our friend's place and I came out of that, uh, the, uh, no, that meeting room and then we spoke and I remember your exact words. You said, Arjun, if your dad wants to live longer, happier and healthier, uh, no need for stents, no need for bypass, whole food plant-based all the way, no oil. And I took that back to my dad and I said, hey dad, this is the pioneer in, in a reversing plant-based, reversing heart disease with plant-based nutrition. You got to give this a chance. And then with renewed confidence, um, he decided to give it a try. So with hesitation, like, you know, he was reluctant, but he decided to try. In two weeks, he was walking longer distances with no shortness of breath. And his uh, blood sugar control was so good that his doctor had to cut his diabetic pills by 50%. In three months, he came off of diabetes medications, blood pressure medications, and cholesterol medications. And in six months, he could finish the heart treadmill stress test that he could not finish before. He had no stents, he had no bypass surgery. It's over six years and he's, he's, uh, he's doing his walks and he's really enjoying his life. And many, many thanks to you, Dr. Assistine, for uh, doing the work you uh, do. It's not just professional, but how of um, like uh, that your attention to detail and your uh, uh, compassion, like, you know, I am a total stranger. You got the message, but you, you know, called right away from uh, and you, you know, spend the time. Later on, I, you know, we got to know you uh, coming to learn from you. We came to Cleveland Clinic and heard you, how you transform and share this five hour lecture to the patients who were recommended to have stents and bypass. And uh, so it was an honor to listen to you and learn from you. Yes. And uh, through Gift of Health, like we have shared this food as medicine concept to, to, to thousands of people so far and not a single, like uh, the program that goes in our sharing without mentioning your name. So it's, a, it's an honor to be in your presence and uh, sharing this platform with you today. Well, Arjun, that, that, thank you for those, uh, for those kind words. Uh, now it's going to be, we won't be finished until a uh, quarter after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start at the, uh, at the beginning and... <clears throat> Shall we share the screen? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Am I doing this right? That's right. That's okay. first. There you yes, go. we yes. can see your screen. Got it. Yeah. Is that we are able to see the screen, yes. Can you, can, can you, can you, uh, is everything like it should be? Yes. Oh yes, looks perfect. And I'm here. This, this won't advance. We gotta do it with this. Do it over here, do it over there. Let me just see. Oh, I got it, I got yes, it. Yes, it's going, yeah. yeah. Now, it's interesting that uh, about 10 years ago, I wrote an editorial for the American Journal of uh, cardiology uh, that was entitled is the present therapy of coronary artery disease the radical mastectomy of the 21st century now what did I mean by that well it was in 1882 that William Halstead at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore Maryland devised the, the radical mastectomy which was going to end all breast cancer but it removed the entire breast, all the skin over the breast, all the muscle under the breast. There was a radical lymph node dissection. The operation was painful, disfiguring, mutilating, and many women preferred to watch the lump in their breast rather than have that operation. But Halstead was such an absolutely towering figure. Uh, and all of his residents went off to be uh, chairman of surgical departments so that they really, for almost over a hundred years, the, uh, this was a standardized surgical error uh, until courageous physicians uh, in, the, in the 1970s and 80s 
began to challenge the radical mastectomy and they found that lesser procedures were equally effective. Now, how do I equate that with coronary artery disease? <clears throat> well, 40 years ago, we developed stents and bypasses and all these fancy drugs. Uh, and when uh, 40 years ago, the leading killer of um, Western civilization was cardiovascular disease. But lo and behold, after 40 years of drugs and stents and bypasses, we still haven't really changed this much at all. And yet, look at today. Just as 100 years ago, we have known that there are multiple cultures on the planet Earth where cardiovascular disease is virtually non-existent. If you hang out your shingle as a cardiac surgeon, in Okinawa, rural China, the Papua Highlands, Central Africa, the Tarahumara Indians in Northern Mexico, forget it. You better plan on selling pencils. You're not gonna have any heart surgery, why? They don't have heart disease, why? They've been thriving for hundreds of years on whole food, plant-based nutrition without oil. Now, this is the oldest slide in my presentation and I took this in 1968 when I was leaving Vietnam, having spent a year there as a combat surgeon, and it reminds me to share with the audience that when we autopsied our GIs in Korea at an average age of 20, 80% of those young soldiers who had died in combat had gross evidence of coronary disease you could see without a microscope. Now, not enough for their cardiac events yet, but here we have that young age already established coronary artery disease. So that study was then repeated uh, actually 45 years later, this time looking at young women and men between the ages of 17 and 34 who have died of, who have died of accidents, homicides and suicides. And lo and behold, now the disease is ubiquitous everybody at that age. So no great surprise that if you've got the foundation of the disease when you're in your late teens, by the time you're in your 40s and 50s, now in Canada, the United States and other Western countries, we now begin to see this absolute tsunami of cardiovascular disease. Now, about 10 years ago, when I was moderating a panel out in Los Angeles. One of the panel members was Lou Culler. Lou Culler is the professor of public health at the University of Pittsburgh. And on that panel that day, uh, as a follow-up to his 10-year cardiovascular health study, Lou Culler made the following pronouncement. All males 65 years and older, and all females 70 years and older who have been exposed to the traditional Western diet have cardiovascular disease and should be treated as such. Quite a pronouncement, but really uh, something that we have to almost, in a way, we have to be ashamed of this when there are other cultures on the planet where this disease doesn't exist. Now, here's a chance we had in World War II to get it right. How unfortunately, we did not. We absolutely blew it. What happened in World War II was the Axis powers of Germany overran the low countries of Holland and Belgium, and they occupied Denmark and Norway. And characteristically, the Germans took away their livestock for their troops. So their cattle, their sheep, their goats, their pigs, their chickens, their turkeys, suddenly they were gone. And now that meant that all these Western European countries had become plant-based. So doctors Strom and Janssen in 1951, reporting in England's medical journal, The Lancet, looked at the death rates from heart disease and uh, stroke in Norway during this time period. So let's do this together. Let's look at this graph starting on the left. And you can see in 1927, Deaths from heart attack and stroke were going up. 1930, going up. 1935, going up. 1940, in come the Germans. Whoop, 41, whoop, 42. Who knew these Germans were these great public health educators? 
what happened in 1945 with the death of Adolf Hitler, the cessation of hostilities in the European theater, back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, back come the strokes, back come the heart attacks. But sadly, we just didn't, we didn't get it. Now, here you can see two blood vessels. If you were saying that the one on the right is very diseased, that is correct. You can see that small opening. And you're probably saying that when that small opening closes off, there'll probably be a heart attack. But interestingly enough, no. Only about 10% of heart attacks come from something that looks this nasty. Yes, that patient is going to have angina and chest pain and shortness of breath. But this is such a slow developing blockage over many decades. Very often the body will make its own bypass. These little tiny threads, these little threads of blood vessels will develop that go around this blockage so that when that tiny opening finally closes off, there will be enough <clears throat> blood supply from these small little collaterals to sustain the downstream viability of the heart muscle. <clears throat> now I want you to look for a moment at the left. That is a normal artery and you are looking at the, even those of you in the back of the room, that tiny little lining of dark cells, the innermost part of the artery is called the endothelium. And that's one of two words that I want you to remember after this presentation tonight. So <clears throat> that's the endothelium. And each cell is an endothelial cell. And that has a remarkable function that we're gonna talk about in a moment. But one of the first things that happens, when you are eating that milkshake, the cheeseburger, the pizza, what happens is those cellular elements within your bloodstream begin to get sticky, sticky, sticky. The endothelium gets sticky. Your platelets, your clotting factors get sticky. Your LDL cholesterol gets sticky. Now let's do this. Let's take a look at a slide from Peter Libby from Harvard. Now, even though I went to Yale, this is perfectly fine. We, 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 we like to see what Harvard has to say. Just to get you oriented here, the blue is where the blood is flowing. And then you can see those tiny little purple cells will separate the flowing blood from the wall of the artery, those again are the endothelial cells. Now let's make sense of this slide together and go, go to the upper left. There in the upper left, you see these orange LDL cholesterol particles, which are now sticky because of what you've been eating. They rub up against the sticky endothelium and they find a crack, a fissure or an opening and they migrate into the subendothelial space, whereupon they are promptly oxidized by these free radicals that we've been eating. And the subendothelial space does not like these small, hard, dense LDL cholesterol particles. And it calls upon our SWAT team to come across and deal with that. And here the SWAT team is demonstrated by Peter Libby of Harvard. He has painted the white blood cells blue in honor of Yale, and we like that. So now you see this blue SWAT cell coming across, going across, gobbling up, gobbling up, gobbling up like Pac-Man, these small, hard, dense, oxidized LDL cholesterol particles until it gets all the way over here to the right, where now it's absolutely chock full. And we in medicine do what we do so often, we change the name. That is now called a foam cell. And the foam cell is truly the Darth Vader of this sequence of events. Why? <laughs> because the foam cell elaborates, manufactures, produces these nasty metalloproteinases called 
stromelicin, elastase, collagenase, myeloperoxidase. What do they do that's so bad? They progressively, <clears throat> these metalloproteinases produced by the foam cell, progressively <clears throat> thin out the cap over the plaque. So let's now look at the figure on the far left. You can see at the top of the plaque, that little white cap now has suddenly got a crack in it. You, because of these metalloproteinases thinning out the cap over the plaque, the sheer force of blood <clears throat> racing over it tears it. Now suddenly you have a rupture of the cap over your plaque. There is now the extravasation of, or the oozing out of, if you will, of plaque content into the flowing blood, which activates our clotting factors like platelets. And suddenly a clot forms. As we go to the middle figure B, you can see the clot forming. And the clot is in and of itself self-propagating. So in a matter of further minutes, we go from the middle figure all the way over to the right. And now what do you see? The clot has completely blocked the entire artery. All the downstream heart muscle has now been deprived of its oxygen and nutrients. That, ladies and gentlemen, is 90% <clears throat> of your heart attacks. Now, if I do my job correctly this evening, hopefully every one of you and your friends and relatives will make themselves heart attack proof. How are you gonna do that? You're gonna make yourself heart attack proof by changing your biochemistry. We're gonna change your biochemistry because we're gonna ask you to change to whole food plant-based nutrition. When you do this, this entire sequence of events that I have just described to you will be halted. You will not have your LDL cholesterol be sticky. It will not migrate into the subendothelial space. It will not be oxidized. You will not have the SWAT team come on. You'll not have the formation of the foam cell. If you do not have the formation of the foam cell, you will not be able to weaken or thin out the cap over your plaque. As a matter of fact, eating plant-based, you will strengthen the cap over the plaque. If you strengthen the cap over your plaque, it cannot rupture. And if it cannot rupture, you have now made yourself heart attack proof, and we think you can do that in about three weeks. Now forget the x-ray here, but I want you to focus on this artery where the artist has shown it that half of the artery is filled with blockage and plaque. The other half is open and you can see in the half that's open, you can still see the endothelial cells lining the inside. Now it was up until about 1980 that we used to think of the endothelial cells as these small, hard, dense, pretty little red bricks that were lining our pipes. 60,000 miles of blood vessels. If you were to take all our endothelial cells and spread them out, you could cover eight tennis courts. All right, but that all changed in 1980. <clears throat> because in 1980, we learned a great deal more about the endothelial cell. Dr. Fershkot, working in his laboratory in Brooklyn, was taking the largest blood vessel, the aorta, from a, these rodents, and he would do this sort of elliptical spiral staircase cut on it, immerse it in a bath of saline, and it would constrict, constrict. But one day, Dr. Fershkot took that aorta, no cut, no injury to the endothelial cell. He immersed it and it dilated, did it with another one. It dilated. Now, suddenly, globally, the race was on. What was the EDRF that Dr. Fershkot had discovered? The endothelial derived relaxation factor kind of rolls right off your tongue. But fortunately, that term was with us for only eight years because at the end of eight years, Dr. Fershkot 
Dr. Murad and Dr. Lou Ignaro discovered that the EDRF was a gas, nitric oxide, nitric oxide. So that's the second of two words that I want you to remember tonight. One was the endothelium, two is nitric oxide. Now, those three gentlemen in 1998 were awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering nitric oxide. Now, what is it about nitric oxide that makes it worthy of having a Nobel Prize? Well, we have to sort of know what are the functions of nitric oxide. One, nitric oxide will keep all those cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. It keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thickened, stiff or inflamed, protect us from getting high blood pressure or hypertension. Number four, number four is the absolute key, a safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from having blockages or plaque. So literally everybody on the planet earth, whether they're from London, Berlin, Chicago, New York, or Newfoundland, if they have cardiovascular disease, it is because by now, by now in the previous decades, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised and turned their endothelial system into an absolute train wreck that they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages and plaque. But the good news is this, this is not a malignancy. And once you can get patients to understand that never, 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 ever again are they to pass through their lips a single morsel that is going to further destroy an already train wrecked endothelium because then the endothelium will recover, make enough nitric oxide so we can not only halt disease progression, but we often see evidence of disease reversal. Now, I know that by this time, a number of you in the audience are saying to yourselves, gosh, I wonder what my level of nitric oxide is. Well, we don't really have a ready handy test for that in the doctor's office. However, the way it's done in a research setting is you take an ultrasound probe, you place it over the brachial artery in your forearm, and there is the diameter, uh, the, excuse me, and there is the, uh, the, the diameter of the artery. Then, for five minutes, you will encircle the upper arm with a blood pressure cuff that you will inflate above systolic blood pressure so that for five minutes, you have absolutely zero blood flow to your forearm and hand. I've had that done. It's not exactly <laughs> habit forming. But then you release the cuff and immediately with the ultrasound probe, once again, remeasure the new diameter of the brachial artery. And in the normal individual, it'll be 30% greater because of the outpouring of nitric oxide while that tourniquet was in place. Now, the next great thing that came along with endothelial cells was the work of Robert Vogel, from a uh, chairman of uh, cardiology at the University of Maryland, who took a group of healthy young subjects to a certain fast food restaurant that is fat characterized by arches, which are golden. Half of those patients got the cornflakes, brachial artery tourniquet test, bloop, normal. The other half had the hash browns and sausages. Within 120 minutes of that meal, those healthy young subjects could not dilate the artery. That single meal of hash browns and sausage had so injured the endothelial capacity to make nitric oxide, they could not dilate the artery. However, being young, as they followed him into the late afternoon, early evening, they began to recover. However, you and I know 
that the next morning for breakfast, it'll be scrambled eggs and bacon. Maybe at lunchtime, it'll be white bread with cold cuts and mayonnaise. And for supper, baked potato with sour cream, lamb chops, vegetables soaked in butter, ranch dressing on a salad, ice cream for dessert. Here in the good old USA, from the time we were children, every day, dawn to dusk, all day long, we are doing our best to destroy our endothelial output of nitric oxide. Now, let me see if I can go back one here, let's see, yeah. This is simply a comparison of what I've just shared with you, namely the flow mediated dilatation and uh, in relationship to the various diets. The worst diet for di dilatation of the artery was the Atkins diet, the high protein diet. Second to worst was the South Beach diet. And then the champ was plant-based. And now this is the new kid on the block. These are the endothelial progenitor cells, uh, which actually come from the uh, uh, vascular endothelium. Now, the endothelial progenitor cells are arise from our bone marrow, and they replace our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells, and we'll have more to say about that later. This happens to be the study that was done uh, confirming that in, uh, in Okinawa, when they took Okinawan women between the ages of 17 and 34, the healthiest human beings on the planet, they divided them into half. Half was the control group and the other half was having five times a day an Okinawan green leafy vegetable. At the end of the study, when they checked the blood, those that had been having the five additional green leafy vegetables had a strikingly higher healthy level of endothelial progenitor cells, and you'll see how that comes along. Uh, I think that in view of the, uh, the time sinks, I'm gonna scoot through some of these. And uh, Let's back up one here. There, your HDL cholesterol is known as your good cholesterol. And it was in the 18, in 1980s and 90s, it would really feel, and even today, people think that the HDL is very important. However, uh, there's been an interesting bit of new research that I'd like to just share with you about that. And that is that the HDL cholesterol in our very first study uh, in the, our patients who were consuming plant-based nutrition, it began to fall. And as a matter of fact, most of those people were, were men. And what, we've, what we discovered was that within several months of starting our program, they all had an HDL cholesterol that was below the accepted normal level uh, in the uh, in males, but at the same time, they were losing weight. At the same time, their symptoms of heart disease were disappearing. And when we carefully studied them, they were reversing their disease. Now, what happened next was that there was a drug company called Pfizer and Pfizer was going to discover uh, or make a pill a, a sort of that was going to actually make your HDL cholesterol go through the roof. And fortunately that never came out because although this drug they called Torcetribib did very well uh, in the first trial and in the second trial, but in this, its final trial before it could go to FDA approval, the chairman of the independent monitoring committee talked to the chairman of Pfizer who was about to release this on the public. And he said, look, we've got a problem here. 
the uh, the Tarsetrabig. In the control trial, there have been 51 deaths, but in the trial of your drug, there were 81 deaths. It was killing people, so fortunately, it didn't come out. Now, I'm going to scoot through a couple of these because we want to, I promised I would get through tonight. Here, what you see are the list of all those really wonderful defense mechanisms. I've talked about the endothelial cell. I've talked about the endothelial progenitor cell. We've talked about the HDL cholesterol. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on dimethyl arginine, dimethyl amino hydrolase, but I want you all to know that every single one of these powerful defense mechanisms is enhanced when you're eating whole food, plant-based nutrition. Now, <clears throat> This is the work of, of Walter Willett. Walter Willett, uh, it was interesting, he is the chairman of public health at Harvard. And he, he made this statement in 2009. The current path, and by that he meant all these bypasses and stents and drugs and all, the current path leads to increasing adiposity, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, disability, and unfit socially isolated populations stuffed with bills subjected to frequent palliative procedures. Now, at this point, I wanted to share with you where the rubber hits the road. What about this when you put it to the test? So this was the first study that I was involved with. And it was small because it was in 1985, 88, when I was still, uh, I was still burdened with my surgical responsibilities, so the study was small, but they all had severe triple vessel coronary disease. And my goal was to see if I couldn't get them to absolutely completely eliminate every single morsel in their diet that was going to injure <clears throat> the endothelial cell. So not a drop of oil, olive oil, corn oil, Soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing. Oil injures the endothelial cell. Also, nothing with the mother or face. No meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and eggs. I don't like dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. Sugary drinks, diet colas, Pepsi and Coke. We'd like to have patients avoid sugary foods, cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excessive maple syrup, molasses, and honey, because sugar injures endothelial cells. I'm a little fussy about avoiding nuts, peanut butter, nut butters, cashew sauce, and avocado. And I like patients to avoid coffee with caffeine. Decaf, yes. Now, for those of you who are nervous about what I said about oil, here is a peer-reviewed scientific journal article, article. Olive, soybean, and palm oil intake have a similar acute detrimental effect over the endothelial function in healthy young subjects. Pretty Pretty powerful stuff. It was in 2019 that I published a scientific article in the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention. And the title of the article that I wrote was, Is Oil Healthy? And in that paper, I discussed the animal studies and the human studies that show how injurious oil is to the endothelial cell. Now, this is the work of uh, Stan Hazen from uh, the Cleveland Clinic where I work. And what Stan was doing was interesting because he was looking at the foods that omnivores are eating that contain these molecules, lecithin and carnitine. And he wanted to see how the microbiome or the gut bacteria of uh, omnivores results in the metabolism of these two molecules producing a molecule called TMA, trimethylamine. 
And trimethylamine is rapidly oxidized in your liver to trimethylamine oxide. And unfortunately, trimethylamine oxide injures your blood vessels. So here is a very, very potent, strong uh, argument for the rationale and why you should avoid animal foods because they contain lecithin and carnitine and then you will develop bacteria in your microbiome that will produce TMAO, which will injure your blood vessels. Here's the schematic, lecithin and carnitine on the left, metabolized by your gut bacteria to TMAO, which injures your blood vessels. But what Stan Hazen found out that was fascinating, if he took somebody who was absolutely 100% plant-based and fed them a lamb chop and measured their blood, no TMAO. So you really are protecting yourself from this way of uh, injury. Now, whoa, let's see here. This is backing up a little bit too much. Let's just, all right. Now this is the one slide in this presentation that has nothing to do with cardiovascular disease. I share with it, with, with, because to me, it was one of the most important times in the history of medicine. When in, in 2015, the World Health Organization, imagine it, representatives from countries throughout the world came to an agreement in 2015 that red meat had the same level of carcinogenicity as smoking cigarettes. All right, what are these folks gonna eat that we've uh, had for this first, this first uh, trial? You're gonna have all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels, 101 different types of legumes and lentils, all these marvelous red, yellow, green leafy vegetables, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, and fruit, and there are many, many wonderful recipes with these, uh, with these foods that are so uh, delicious. And to think to, remain, to, make, to achieve optimal health, you have to eat delicious food. Now, there's one other thing that I wanna make clear here. And that is, by now you know that the reason people who have, people have with cardiovascular disease have their disease because they have so trashed their endothelial cells, they don't have enough nitric oxide remaining, all right? Now, the endothelial production of nitric oxide is age dependent. So you've never heard of a boy or girl at age eight having a heart attack, right? They've got nitric oxide coming out of their ears, but by the time you're 50, even if you're beautifully healthy, you now have 50% of the endothelial production of nitric oxide that you had when you were age 25. And by the time you're 80, you lost 70% of the endothelial production of nitric oxide. So what we wanna do is we wanna try to spur on the endothelial cells if we can to make them be more productive. But most important of all, take advantage of the new research within the last 12 years that shows us that mankind has an alternate pathway for making nitric oxide. So here's the way it works. I've got a patient with heart disease. I try to get them to imagine shrinking their head to a size they could crawl in the arteries of their heart and they would see the blockage is an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation. So we need antioxidants, but no, do not go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant because it doesn't work and it's gonna be harmful. I need you to get your antioxidants from food. Fair enough. What food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value. O-R-A-C, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So if you're having Raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, and blackberries with your morning oat cereal. That's a terrific start. However, nothing, nothing, nothing can trump the antioxidant value of green leafy vegetables. So I need you to chew a green leafy vegetable six times a day, roughly the size of half of your fist, 
after it has first been boiled in water or steamed, five and a half to six minutes, so it's nice and tender, then you must anoint it with multiple drops of a delightful balsamic or rice vinegar. Why? Because research has shown us that the acetic acid from those vinegars will restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell responsible for making nitric oxide. So you're gonna chew this alongside your breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again with your lunch and sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, dinner time, five. And of course, I adore it when you have that evening snack of arugula and kale. Now, the second benefit of chewing the green, it stimulates your bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cells, which will replace our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. The third benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable, this is most, most important of all. The third benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable is when you are chewing a green nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria are going to reduce the green nitrate you're chewing to a nitrite. Now, when you swallow the nitrite, it is your own gastric acid, which will reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. So think about it. With no added expense, no hideous side effects, from dawn to dusk, morning to night, all day long, you are absolutely restoring nitric oxide, the very molecule, the deficiency of which gave you this disease in the first place. Now, there is a caveat to this. Toothpaste with fluoride, public drinking water with fluoride, mouthwash, all will injure the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. And we do not like patients to consume antacids because antacids will reduce your gastric acidity and you will be unable to reduce the nitric, the nit you'll be unable to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. Now, you're probably wondering, what are the green leafy vegetables that Dr. Esselstyn is talking about? They are. Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, snapper cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And the top six are kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. And look what it does for your memory. <laughs> now, forget it, no oil with apologies to Leonardo da Vinci. So this first group had a mean cholesterol amongst the, all of them of 237. And over the next uh, five and 12 years, they, uh, <clears throat> yes, it went for 12 years, which I think makes it one of the longest studies of its type. <clears throat> they kept their cholesterol total under 145. Oh, I can't forget, you're probably in uh, Canadian units, but that was at least very respectable. I want to share with you now <clears throat> some angiograms from this group. And I should share with you that these angiograms were reviewed in triplicate in the Cleveland Clinic Angiography Core Laboratory by senior technicians that do this all day long for national medical trials, so that when I give you a percentage of reversal or improvement, I know it's accurate. This happens to be a 67 year old retired pediatrician. You're looking at the left anterior descending coronary artery and the amount of improvement from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right was described as 10%, which is about as small as the naked eye can see. This next is a, is a 58 year old factory worker. You're looking at the circumflex artery to the back of the heart and from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right, uh, that was described as a 20% improvement. Now, here we have a 54-year-old retired security guard 
the right coronary artery, and from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right was described as a 30% improvement. Now this young fellow is in the first uh, chapter in my book, my colleague and friend, Dr. Joseph Crow, who at age 44 in 1996 began getting chest pain. Cholesterol was 156, he was not hypertensive, he was not a smoker, he was not diabetic, he exercised regularly, he was not overweight, chest pain. Cardiology worked him up in October of 1996, could find nothing. In November of 96, a month later, he was finishing his, post, his uh, operative schedule and sat down to write post-operative orders when suddenly the elephant was on his chest, pain in his left shoulder, jaw, arm. Joe was having a heart attack. He was whipped down to the catheterization laboratory. They start the catheterization, cardiac arrest, resuscitate, finish the catheterization, one more cardiac arrest, resuscitate, stabilized, up to the floor. Three days later, he's discharged, but he's very depressed. He was depressed because at the time of his uh, angiogram, in the entire lower one third of his left anterior descending coronary artery, as you can see next to this yellow bracket, it was all moth-eaten and disease over too long a segment. You can't just pound in stent after stent after stent. It was too far down the artery to have a bypass. So he felt depressed. So Ann and I, my, my wife and I had Joe and his wife out for supper two weeks after his heart attack. Joe, come on. You've been eating this absolutely horrible Western diet. You got the typical disease. We've got now 10 years of data. Why don't you think about going plant-based? And he said, yes, I'll do it. I'll give it a shot. They couldn't offer me anything else, but uh, I'm not gonna take those statin drugs. I don't trust them, too many side effects. Fine, I said, no problem. He became the absolute commitment uh, to whole food plant-based nutrition. And over the next two and a half years, his total cholesterol plummeted. His LDL, his bad cholesterol, went from 98 down to 38. Then he had another angiogram. Now, up in the surgical office areas, our doors are three doors apart. So at noontime, on the day that I knew earlier in the morning, Joe had had his follow-up angiogram, I walked over to his office, opened the door. There he was behind his desk. And I said, Joe, I understand you had the follow-up angiogram. Mind sharing with me? How did it go? So he came around and put his arms around me and said, I think we may be doing okay. So I said, well, would there be any chance that I could see the angiogram? He said, sure. Now, that's pretty exciting. And when you see this come back to normal, uh, it really makes you feel how, how much more powerful could it be? Now, what we have learned is that in the younger patient, when the plaque is made up of inflammation, flat, and cholesterol, you can see this type of reversal. But when the plaque is in the older patients, and it's been there for decades, and it's now made up of, not, no longer made up of inflammation, fat, and cholesterol, and now it's made up of fibrosis, scar, and calcification, the likelihood of it going away is considerably less. But what we have found is, nevertheless, even those patients can get back to full activity of daily living without restriction. And I'm gonna, it's gonna be my responsibility as uh, before we finish to show you how that happens. <clears throat> now here is another uh, fellow at the, uh, <clears throat> who is uh, 45 years old and he was from Florida. And at July 14th of 2017, he had a heart attack and he had multiple blockages. And this one that you're seeing with the arrow is in the obtuse marginal branch of the circumflex. And it was described as an 80% narrowing. Now he had other narrowings, which made the cardiologist who was treating him say, you've got to have bypass surgery. He said, no. The patient said, I'm going to read, I'm reading a book called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And uh, I want to go with the diet. And the 
cardiologist was very uh, upset and skeptical. But nevertheless, the patient persisted and the, uh, he agreed to another angiogram a year later, July of 2018. What did he find? What formerly was 80% blocked was now 40% blocked. Well, then he switched cardiologists, stuck with the diet, with the new cardiologist a year and a half later wanted another angiogram and now it was all gone. Now, to me, this is such a powerful situation because here, literally, here was a patient where no doctor was supportive of his willingness to treat the causation of the illness. And I think that yet it really sends a very, very strong message that literally with a method that is no additional expense, no hideous side effects, so powerful in rever reversing the disease, every patient at least should be offered this uh, option. The only reason I found out about this was my the patient after this last angiogram that showed it completely gone away, he found me and wrote me a letter thanking me for writing the book Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease that he'd been following. Uh, and at the same time, he sent me these uh, uh, angiograms, which I share with you. All right. I want to go back to that original study. Uh, there were six of our original 24 nice guys, but they just didn't, uh, I knew within the first month that they were not going to follow this program. So they were returned, they were returned to their expert cardiologist, never, never participating in our program, but they became sort of my quasi control group. And we followed them uh, over <clears throat> the 12 years. And of those uh, six patients, uh, they had this increasing worsening of their disease as you see categorized here, and actually uh, two of them uh, died. Now, on the other hand, let's look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, those 18 patients who stayed with us for 12 years. I wanted to know those 18 patients who were cared for by, by expert cardiologists prior to coming into our study, in those eight years while they were under expert care, they had these 49 coronary events of worsening disease that you see categorized here. However, once those same patients came with us over the next 12 years, 17 of those 18 had no further events. Yes, there was one little sheep at six years who wandered from the flock, got into the lamb chops, french fries, glazed donuts, more angina, had a bypass, but now is back with the flock that proves the point that I'm sharing with you. Well, as proud as and excited as I was for that first study and some of the results that we had, uh, let's just say that <laughs> I, I was met with a little bit of uh, resistance and uh, Dr. Esselstyn, that's a small group. Dr. Esselstyn, there's no, it was really, it wasn't randomized. Dr. Esselstyn, your diet is really uh, pretty severe and strict. What makes you think you could ever repeat that study with a larger group and get similar results? So we did. And their the concern was for many of them, they said, I, they can't get their patients to, to follow this program. So this time it was some 200 patients, but we lost two to follow up. So it was 198. Now look at this. How many of those patients over close to four years were adherent? 177 out of those 198 followed the program. And that's close to 90%. How do you get 90% of patients to follow this program? I think if you're going to get a patient to make a lifestyle change. You must show the patient respect. And the only way that I know to show a patient respect is to give them my time. And with the present format, 
I see patients once a month, usually no more than 18 or 20, but now, of course, it's virtual because of this pandemic. But during that day of our seminar, it is five and a half hours. We always insist they be there with their spouse or significant other. During that five and a half hours, they're going to learn all about how they have created their disease and precisely how we are going to empower them as the locus of control to halt and reverse their disease. And since I'm a little bit old fashioned, every one of those patients, my secretary will give me their phone numbers 10 days beforehand so that I can all personally call every one of them, get my arms around their story, and at the same time, <clears throat> see if we can't answer questions that they have so that coming to the seminar, we have a strong platform from which we can all move forward. And I know of very few physicians who will spend five and a half hours with their patients, but with this panel and this group, it is so absolutely essential that they understand how they created their disease by destroying their endothelial cell ability to make nitric oxide, the molecule that was gonna protect them. And it's pretty exciting to think that once a patient is sitting there and, and they know exactly the reason they had their heart attack was that they were responsible for destroying their endothelial cells. Now they've been told how to restore them, get the nitric oxide back, who, who in the, with a brain in their head is going to not do that? So the exciting thing here, if you look at the middle line, there were in that group, 27 patients who have been told they had to have stents or bypasses. We are now at the point where literally anybody who is not an emergency, who's not in the middle of a heart attack, but is having an elective stent or elective procedure, <clears throat> if they uh, follow our program, they'll never have to have it. So in those patients who were adherent, <clears throat> one patient had a small stroke while he was totally misbehaving while he was in China, eating off the economy, all that salt. He had a tendency to have high blood pressure. He had a small cerebellar stroke from which he recovered. The non-adherent 21 patients, 62% had disease progression. Now, uh, what I want you to see here is I've compared our results with some of the best known cardiovascular studies that are out there today. Let's start on the right with the Lyon in that box, the Lyon Diet Heart Study. And the Lyon Diet Heart Study, uh, at the end of four years, 25% had had a heart attack, stroke, or death. The box next to the left there, the natural history of coronary artery disease from Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. At the end of four years, 20% heart attack, stroke, and death. Let's go to the left one more time. That's Bill Bowden's Courage study, 19%. So there you go. Somewhere around 22 or 23%. Heart attack, stroke, and death. But now look at the left. There we are. TTC, treat the cause six-tenths of a percent. That's over a 30-fold difference in our results. Why? Because we are treating the causation of the illness. Ever since the days of Hippocrates, there's been a basic covenant of trust that whenever possible, the caregiver, caregiver will share with the patient what is the causation uh, of, the, uh, of the illness. Now, here we are. It's July of 2014. Another study, this time it, was, it contained only three patients. What right did I have to write up three patients? Well, to me, they absolutely personified, they personified the, the downside of the way cardiovascular disease is treated today. Now, this first gentleman is from Newfoundland, Canada. Bob Mercer, he uh, had a complete blockage of the right carotid artery going to his brain at age 44. And he had a small stroke from which he recovered. But he also at that time had very severe angina, chest pain. 
And believe it or not, they found a courageous phys a surgeon in Toronto who would operate on him, even though he had one artery to his brain completely occluded. And he did had a wonderful result from that for until he was now 69 years of age. Now he was in real trouble again. All of his angina and chest pain had recurred. And he had gained 40 pounds and he was now diabetic. He had erectile dysfunction. And most concerning of all, the one remaining carotid artery in his left side was now 90% blocked. And of all things to have happen at this moment, his 37 year old daughter had her heart attack. And it was during her convalescence that she came upon a book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And she said to her father, Pop, we got to do this together. And they did. And a year later, I got a letter when I first heard about Bob Mercer. Dr. Esselstyn, I wanted to thank you. My daughter and I have followed your book. I have lost 40 pounds. My angina has disappeared. My diabetes has disappeared. My erectile dysfunction has disappeared. And my one remaining carotid artery, which was 90% blocked a year ago, is now 67% blocked. And lo and behold, here is a picture of Bob Mercer in Newfoundland. <laughs> All right. Now, I'll just skip one and we'll go. Let's right on the. Here on the upper left, you can see Jim McNamara. At age 55, he had had a stroke. And it was uh, a, a stroke that had actually kind of occurred after he had some uh, sur unsuccessful surgery on his right carotid. Uh, <clears throat> then he uh, began to get all this pain in his left calf because he had blockages that were forming uh, in, his, uh, in his artery in his thigh. And somehow his wife found our program. He came on board. And before he came on board, he had had three operative procedures on his leg, all of which were unsuccessful. And he was absolutely having his life destroyed when he would put his leg up in bed at night, within a half hour, he'd have this severe tingling and he'd have to drape the leg over the bed to try to get a little bit more blood supply in it. His wife found our program and Jim was absolutely 100% compliant. Within several months, all of his numbness and tingling went away. He lost 44 pounds. He had been pre-diabetic. He lost that state. And he is now such an eloquent spokesperson that every time we have our seminar, Jim always is able to uh, eloquently wrap it up with an absolutely scintillating uh, uh, articulation of his, uh, his, experience, his experience. So let's summarize. When you compare the diet with stents and bypasses, there is no mortality with the diet. There's no morbidity with the diet. There's no added expense and benefits improve with time. And today, most patients who have had a heart attack are walking around wondering with the sword of Damocles hanging over their head, when does the other shoe fall? When do I get my next heart attack? Nonsense. You absolutely never have to have another heart attack. You can make yourself heart attack proof. All right. Now, this is an interesting uh, study. We know that in Sweden, as well as in the United States, by age 85, 50% of people will have dementia. Now, really, it was Megan Leary and her team from the West Coast, uh, who in the 2001 meetings in Miami on stroke, uh, had reviewed over 5,500 MRIs of the brains of Americans. And what they begin to find at age 50, they see these little, little tiny white spots. These little tiny white spots at age 50 are little, little strokes. But you know, here you are, big brain. 
tiny little stroke, not a problem. However, now you're suddenly no longer 50, you're 65. And now more often than before, you find yourself saying, sweetheart, where did I leave the car keys? Well, you know, you kind of work through that, not, a, not really a problem, but now suddenly you're no longer 65, you're 75. And you look at your sweetheart and you say, sweetheart, where'd I leave the car? Well, you kind of get through that and she's understanding. So now you're 85 and you look at her and you say, are you my sweetheart? I can't reverse that. You don't suddenly wake up on your 85th birthday with dementia. You work hard in all those preceding decades to lay the foundation. And here's an example of a normal MRI of the brain, normal. Here's another one. I counted 90 of these little strokes. Imagine a message trying to go through that scar tissue. Now here you have on the left, a brain that is normal, large size, right up as you look at the top of the brain where it meets the skull, there's no gap. But if you look at the right, the brain is shrunk. That's brain atrophy. Look at the gap between the top of the brain and the skull. How do you keep from getting brain atrophy? Exercise, what enlarges? The hippocampus, yeah, and the frontal lobes. How do you do that? By exercise, maybe walking, running, swimming, cycling. Exercise is key. And here's another. On the left, you have what? The thigh, th an MRI of the thigh muscle of a 40-year-old triathlete. The upper right, the thigh muscle of a 74-year-old couch potato. The lower right, a 70-year-old triathlete. The message is clear. Keep exercising. All right. Now on the left, you're looking at the pulse volume of one of my patients who in crossing the skyway to my office had to stop five times crossing the skyway because of pain in his calf muscle, claudication, because he had a partially blocked artery in his thigh. But I was so focused on his heart, I totally forgot about his leg. Until 10 months into our study, he said to me one morning, Dr. Esselstyn, do you recall when I first started seeing you, I had to stop five times crossing the skyway to your office? Yes. He said, you know, in the last month, I don't stop. The pain is gone. I said, well, Don, back you go to the vascular lab. Now, if you look at the pulse volume on the right and compare it to the left, it is double. We now suddenly had, in 1986, we had absolutely rock solid, irrefutable science that food and food alone could absolutely reverse cardiovascular disease. And you're gonna say, well, wait a minute. What about the statin drugs? Well, <laughs> wait a minute. This is 1986. We didn't have any statin drugs. So this is the second patient I've shown you to tonight. One refused statin drugs, the others, they weren't available. If you do this, you don't have to take the statin drugs. All right. Now here's another. This happens to be a 80, no, a, a 78 year old retired high school chemistry teacher. And he and his wife in their retirement, they loved to enter these square dance contests. However, it was during the fast square dance contest, during the fast square dance, he was getting bilateral pain in his calf because of his blocked arteries upstream. Well, he didn't like the huge operation that was planned for him by the vascular surgeons who got these images. And he found us over the internet came for counseling and during counseling, he said, Dr. Esselstyn, if I choose your method, how long will it take me to get rid of this calf pain? So I looked at him with great wisdom in my face. And I said, probably about 10 or 11 months. Three months later, I got a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. The pain is gone. Now, I don't know what it's like in Newfoundland, but I do know that uh, here in Cleveland, 
when you're watching a mystery uh, or a sporting event, just before the advertisement comes on, you will hear the mellifluous tones of the announcer say something like, when the moment is right, will you be ready? Now, we all know that the penile artery is really quite tiny compared to the coronary artery to the heart. So not infrequently, almost like a canary in the coal mine. Before somebody uh, comes down with heart disease, they'll probably find they're no longer able to uh, raise the flag. However, all is not lost, not infrequently. Maybe 10 or 11 months after I've counseled somebody, I'll get a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, sure enough, yes. This is Mr. So-and-so. Yep, good to hear your voice. Yeah, Doc, I really thought I ought to give you a call because recently something has come up and I'm wondering if I don't owe you another check. All right. I promised you that when we started that we would talk about what about when the blockage doesn't go away? How do these patients restore their blood supply. This, what you're looking at here, happens to be a PET scan, a PET rubidium dipyridamol scan. And the PET scan on the left, where it is orange or where it is yellow, that is good blood supply. But in this 58-year-old uh, Youngstown school bus driver, in the middle, it's all green. That's ischemic. That's poor blood supply. So I counseled him at the time he had that PET scan. And then we repeated it. Six weeks later, it's all back. How's that? Nobody washes out a blockage or a plaque in six weeks. Here's another. This happens to be a 60-year-old downtown Cleveland stockbroker with a cholesterol of 248 when we first saw him. And there on the left, once again, you can see where it's orange or yellow, there's good perfusion. But on the right, there is a green area that's poor. But this time we brought him back after I counseled him there initially. Three weeks later, it was reperfusing. Now, wait a minute. How does that, how does that happen? So, This is a look, you're looking at the heart muscle here, excuse me, you're looking at the heart, but all the muscle is gone. You're looking at the blood supply to the heart and you can see the areas, that the, the arteries that get all the notoriety are the three main coronary arteries, the left coronary artery, the left anterior descending, the right coronary artery and the circumflex. And where do they go? Well. They ride for a while, they ride on the surface of the heart, and that's where they get all the publicity of the stents and bypasses, but where do they go? As you can see in this slide, they all dive into the heart muscle where they're supposed to go. And look at that. You can see there literally are thousands and thousands of these interlacing arteries in the heart muscle. So I went to see Rodriguez, who was the chairman of cardiovascular pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. And I, he dissects 200 hearts a year from the deceased. And I asked him, Rod, how often do you ever see good old fashioned garden variety plaque once the artery has dived into the muscle? His answer, never. Now I had the answer because what happens to the endothelial cell, when we initially see these patients, their endothelial cells are absolutely so beaten down. Not only are they barely making any nitric oxide, the great vessel dilator, but now your endothelial cells have become your enemy. And they are making two molecules, endothelin and thromboxane, which are blood vessel constrictors. So even though there is no plaque in those thousands and thousands of interlacing intramuscular extensions of these vessels, they are all narrowed. 
they are pinched by the endothelin and thromboxane being manufactured by this injured endothelium. And that's what's so dramatic about these patients because as soon as they start eating correctly, they stop any further injury to the endothelium. The endothelium recovers, makes more nitric oxide the vessel dilator, stops making endothelin and thromboxane, which is pinching and narrowing these thousands and thousands of intramuscular vessels. That's why these patients are so exciting and gratified because within, literally within days, within days, they know they're on the right track. They used to walk two blocks, let's say, before they got chest pressure or pain. Suddenly now they can walk five blocks before they get it and they know they're on the right path. Now let's summarize the reversal. You can see reversal on an angiogram. You can see it in a stress test. You can see that I just showed you the PET scan reversal. We talked about carotid ultrasound. We showed you the pulse volume and talked about the symptoms of reversing of angina, claudication, and erectile dysfunction. Now, <clears throat> the exciting thing is, and we don't have too much time for this, but when you are treating patients with heart disease, it's not only their uh, heart disease that you're curing. When they eat this way, away goes their diabetes, away, away goes their hypertension, away goes their risk for stroke, away goes their risk for dementia and Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and multiple sclerosis, allergies and asthma. It's, Never before have we been handed such a powerful hand. Now, this is interesting because this shows how it can work in a nation. Here we are in 1972. North Karelia was a province in Finland that was the heart attack capital of the world. Six to 700 hearts per 100,000. And it was such an embarrassment to Finland that a courageous, young physician named Pekka Puska from Helsinki went to Karelia where, where they were smoking, where they were eating all these animal products and everything always seemed to have clotted cream on it. And he spoke with the community leaders. He spoke with the community. He spoke and tussled, tussled with the dairy industry and got them uh, really anti-smoking. And look what happened. In the next 30 years, Northern Karelia decreased their heart attack rate by 85%. The rest of Finland caught on a few years later and over the same time period, they decreased their heart attack rate by 80%. Pretty powerful how that can uh, really affect the health. And what is to me what is so exciting is this, the uh, second line from the bottom. How much of a decrease in cancer was there in North Karelia during the same time period, 67%. So food is so incredibly powerful. Here is another patient uh, sent, uh, actually a slide of a patient of Dave Schumann who sent his slide to me because it shows that when the patient started the diet, immediately you can see the blood glucose levels plummeting towards normal, and he said, I've got to get you a new slide. This patient no longer has diabetes. Here's a, another of his patients who was thriving on meat and dairy. And ordinarily, the urinary calcium level should be in that blue band. But she was, uh, you can see, she was literally peeing away her bones. But as soon as she stopped and switched to a plant-based diet, within one week, she was no longer uh, losing calcium in the urine. This happens to be Joe Rolino, uh, who was a world famous strongman in Coney Island in 1920s. He and his mother were from the old country. They lived in, uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, he was famous for being able to bend spikes in his teeth. And here is Joe Rolino at age 103. Well, now wrapping it up, I just want you to know that for many years in my uh, career, I was a surgeon on the eighth floor of this building, but I show you this slide. 
because I want those of you from Newfoundland to know what the trees look like in Cleveland <laughs> in February. <laughs> However, when I retired from surgery, I was hired by the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute where the budget is a little bit more modest, but the morale is still quite high. And one thing I've learned in some 60 years since graduating from medical school, uh, nothing, yes, brains and brains are important, but nothing, nothing, nothing is as important as persistence, persistence, persistence. Best exemplified by this young damsel uh, in the Life magazine, 1939, trying to learn how to do the splits. But she stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it. And sure enough, the other day in downtown in Newfoundland, I guess it was Chauvin who uh, spotted her <laughs> and she got it right. <laughs> Now, what I wanted to say and in conclusion is I want to say again, I say how much I appreciate the opportunity to share my, share my research and clinical strategies with these patients. And the reason that I am so uh, excited about medicine, even though it's been 60, uh, actually 20 years since I retired from surgery, what really is, uh, is, is so exciting is that I think I see uh, on the horizon what really is going to be a, an a, a incredible uh, improvement in the health scheme. And it's not going to come about from the invention of another pill. Actually, it's going to be a seismic revolution. And the seismic revolution will not come about with the invention of another pill, an operation, or a procedure. The seismic revolution will come about when we in the profession have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public what is the lifestyle, and most specifically, what is the nutritional literacy that will empower them as a locus of control to absolutely annihilate chronic illness. Thank you. I have to go. You have to get my face on because of questions. Uh, oh, here I am. I don't want that. I'm done with that. Yeah, you could stop share. Uh, uh, yes, wonderful. Yes, yes wonderful. we can see you now. Wonderful. Yeah. I'll meet you there. Yes. Okay. Uh, and before you go, we just want to say one thing. Like you know, it's so. Before you leave, we want to say so. Thank you for making sure this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Dr. Uh, Esselstyn. I must say that this is one of the most educational, enlightening, engaging, and entertaining <laughs> all at the same time. <laughs> so it's so, uh, you know, it's a, such an honor to listen to you, to share all this information. It is so um, like life-changing, like uh, our viewers, they found it so, so helpful. Like we have uh, so many uh, like, uh, uh, like comments and how, young and dashing you look like people are saying there <laughs> like you you know people can't believe that you're 87 and um that um you living you're you're living you're you're walking and living example of what you're you know uh teaching and that's that's really inspiring for us so thank you for uh yeah. doing that yes um i know uh like we have some questions so uh is it okay like we have some questions from viewers and i know like uh, we could you know quickly run through them like some of them i think you have already covered uh so yeah, one question I don't, I don't, I don't so, uh, yeah. so one question is uh if i'm eating my greens raw so am i not uh, getting the benefit uh no i no you yeah obviously there's going to be some benefit i i just Think that there are uh, there is some information that suggests that when you cook, uh, it helps to break down the cell membranes. So that when you uh, chew, get, you're much more. Uh, you find that the phytonutrients are much more available. Yeah. So another question related to that, like uh, I'm taking greens in the form of smoothies and adding a little bit of fruit, so that 
I can uh, enjoy taking greens. So is that I, okay? I, I don't like that. Okay. I because uh, when you, two things I think are uh, I'm concerned about. One, when you blend those, you somehow d decrease the benefit of the fiber. And also, uh, it's sort of tart if you don't put fruit in. So when you, I have no problem with your eating an apple, an orange, and banana, because the fructose there is bound to the fiber and the absorption is slow. When you beat it up in a smoothie, and you separate the apple, the orange, you separate the fructose from the fiber. Now the sugar goes off in your stomach like a rocket, injures the liver, glycates protein, and injures the endothelial cell. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So here is a, another question. I think you covered most of it. Like it says, what advice would you give a person who's recovering from a stroke? Is recovering from a stroke? Well, uh, depending upon uh, how disabled they were from the stroke, I think <clears throat> a combination of certainly a, of physical therapy, and they may have to take some medication. And also, uh, <clears throat> I think it's going to be important to absolutely do everything they can from a nutritional standpoint to halt and reverse the disease in those arteries. And then... Mm -hmm. So th there is this question, uh, it says uh, like, if one has already cut out meats, dairy, oils, and simple sugars, are there any specific foods especially pertinent to preventing heart disease that are recommended uh, in a whole food plant-based lifestyle? Well, I think that I had a slide of that. <clears throat> and I think it's nice that people will eat whole grains, W-H-O-L-E. Mm -hmm. And if they want to uh, really be pure about the grain, if you avoid flour, uh, if you avoid pasta and bread and rolls and bagels, and you get <clears throat> your grain from whole grains. Because when you make flour, when you, when you grind a grain into flour, you destroy the nutri nu nutrition. So the flour manufacturers know this. So they sprinkle a little bit of nutrition back in and they call their product enriched. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's it. But if you're eating plenty of other uh, grains, you certainly can have pasta, bread and rolls and bagels, but for, especially for people who are, where weight is an issue, they absolutely have got to cut out the flour. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 But you so can also like, have, we, we talked about, you said the other, besides having grain, uh, 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 you know, legumes are so key. Pasta, bread, rolls, bagels, legumes, all those wonderful red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, and fruit. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we also have other questions. So if I'm just eating two times a day uh, or three times uh, um like you had recommended eating like six times, like eating green six times, but like if just, if I'm eating just uh, two times a day, so how does that work? You, you, well, you add, you add four to the two when you get sick. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll continue. So, and does drinking eight to 12 cups of water, does it play a direct role in preventing clogged arteries? No, I, not that I know of. I think your 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 drinking water is guided by your thirst. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, what does uh, what do you think of consuming dark chocolate in moderation as a part of healthy diet? And uh, not much. Not much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And do all the greens have to be steamed? No, they can be. Uh, you can be uh, cooked in boiling water. Okay. Or steam, either one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other person is asking, uh, uh, curious to know if vinegars can be, other vinegars can be as good as balsamic and rice vinegar. I, what the, do you think about that? I, well, I was following the research. I have not seen research with others. The one, the research that I know of is with rice or balsamic. Mm. Gotcha. It might, others might work, but I haven't seen the research. Mm -hmm. So here is a, a question from Dr. Madhuri. Uh, she's asking a 37 year old with Marfan's status post hemi arch graft bental procedure in 2008, mechanical aortic valve on Coumadin, 
recent type B aortic dissection, medical management, uh, what can he eat to keep INR therapeutic? What foods can stimulate nitric oxide production that don't contain high vitamin K and to protect his endothelium? Well, uh, we've, I think we've, uh, I think I listed yes. in the presentation mm -hmm. the foods that injure. So you really want to stay away from the foods that are going to injure. So you stay away from, we'll, we'll go through it again if they want. So the question is, are there any foods that stimulate nitric oxide production that don't contain high vitamin K? Well, uh, uh, let me just address that because the question about vitamin K is because of the fact that the person is on a Coumadin. Yes, yes. We, enco we encounter that all the time over the last 20 or 30 years. It is the responsibility of the physician who is administering the Coumadin to keep the INR in a, in a, uh, 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 in a, uh, in a physiologic range that is going to be effective as an anticoagulant. But if, the, but at the same time, that the patient should not be denied. So if the patient will say to the doctor, look, I'm going to be eating this number of grain leafy vegetables every week, then they can adjust the Coumadin dose accordingly. Mm -hmm. so because, being, because, being, the, because the greens are the most powerful food for restoring the nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. So basically the message is don't need to avoid the greens. You just uh, monitor the INR frequently and- to Avoid a physician who is stubborn and will not change. The dose. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, yeah. Uh, so here, uh, nearly all endocrinologists and cardiologists want a diabetic patient to have a statin. Uh, like, that's, but that's that's look how many uh, almost all those statin studies mm -hmm. were conducted using the typical West. How many people, when those statin studies were eating 100 percent whole food, plant based nutrition? Not much. None? Any? Yeah. None. Any? Yeah. Any? Mm -hmm. So what you're asking patients to do is to, you know, to take a drug that is totally unnecessary if you're willing to commit to whole food plant-based nutrition. Mm. So no, I, I, don't, I don't like to get in a wrestling match with, with people with their medication. I ask the patients to become their own advocate with the doctor and explain, you know, it's a, you see, <laughs> Right now, anybody who has heart disease, there's just an almost, it's almost automatic that there's this uh, prepared formula of you're going to get a beta blocker, you're going to get aspirin, you're going to get a stent, you're going to get a statin. You know, it's mm -hmm. not very creative. Yes, and not many times that they're offered the option of plant-based uh, lifestyle. Well, oh, no, but it's not the fault so much of the doctor is the fact that they have never had any teaching in this. They never in medical school and never in their postgraduate years do they ever get training in nutrition. Mm. All we are trained to use drugs. And who profits from the drugs? I mean, yeah. you know what now? Medicine becomes profitable when people are ill and sick, which is silly. We, 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 ought to, we really have to have a commitment like you two would do to try to show patients how to live a life that they don't get sick. Oh, that's what makes this so exciting. Yes, it is. <laughs> we get so excited when we can, you know, when the patients are making the changes that their, their mm -hmm. body needs and they're able to recover get, and get, get off them, the medication. Get, yeah, get, get them to understand the relationship between the endothelial cells and nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why they're sick. <laughs> uh, okay. So for a person who's on whole food, plant-based, no oil nutrition uh, since 2020, since one year, what kind of blood tests do you recommend annually to check heart health? Well, uh, if they've had a baseline uh, and a... Uh, Stress echo stress test. Okay. It's so safe. There's no contrast to injure the kidney. There's no mm -hmm. radiation. And it can give you a, a, an idea of how that 
it really should be, after a year, it should show marked improvement or back to normal. Wonderful, like a stress echocardiogram, yes. So the next one is, uh, since uh, I started whole food plant-based, my total cholesterol has dropped significantly. But because I have a type of hereditary high cholesterol, I've been told that I'm required to be on a low-dose statin. Is it possible to discontinue statins? I have no symptoms of coronary artery disease. Yeah, I, I don't see why, but I'm not gonna, I'm not going to get in a wrestling match with yes. you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they have to know, well know why. All I can say is that there are many patients who come to us who long before they came to us, they were found out they simply couldn't take a statin because of the side effects of severe muscle pain, injury to their liver, it caused diabetes or it gave them brain fog. And they've come, they said they, and they're not taking a statin. They're going to do just as well as the people who are taking statin, providing they follow the program appropriately. Yeah. Mm. I mean, how, how many statin drugs do you suppose are taking in rural China or Central Africa or the Okinawa or the Papua Highlanders? How many statins do they take? Never. Yeah. What heart do they, do they have? Never. Yes, that is so true. Uh, so this person is uh, is asking, like, is it claimed that small LDL are atherogenic, whereas the large LDL particles are not? Is it possible? And thermokinetic would perhaps predict all nearly uh, LDL atherogenic damage in endothelium. Wondering about your opinion on this. Well, I think rather than get you know tied up in knots about particles, on, you ever, did, you ever, did, you ever, did you ever read at the bottom of those uh, particle things where it says that this that this test is yet to be approved by the FDA? Yeah. <laughs> Not even, and I and I try to tell patients, look, no number, no number has ever caused heart disease. Heart disease is caused by what is passing through your lips every day. It has mm -hmm. the capacity to injure your endothelial production of nitric oxide. That's beautiful. Heart disease is caused by what is passing through your lips every day. We're going to quote that, Dr. Sustain. <laughs> <laughs> so another person... Uh, uh, like, it's like, why do you not recommend coffee? Can it be consumed in moderation, like one cup a day? Is it really hard to... <laughs> to <laughs> I know, I don't, I don't like... I, the reason I, I found there are two studies, one Greek, one Italian. I'll share the Italian study. They took healthy <clears throat> young subjects, divided them in half. One group drinks coffee with caffeine. The other group drinks decaf. After they drink it, then they have the brachial artery tourniquet test, which is a test for endothelial function. Then <clears throat> they switch groups. The group formerly that was having coffee with decaf, now is having coffee with caffeine. Guess what? It was always the group that was having coffee with caffeine that injured the endothelial cells. Mm. There you have it, <laughs> coffee. <laughs> yeah, so Madhu is asking, once we meet total cholesterol and LDL goals in people with heart disease with whole food plant-based diet, how worried we should be about how low HDL and how to bring it up? Don't, don't remember, I talked about the HDL cholesterol. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when a, anytime that you put a patient on whole food plant-based nutrition, which is such an anti-inflammatory diet, as the person's body inflammation disappears, the liver, which has been making this highly anti-inflammatory molecule of HDL says, I don't have to make as much anymore. They always start dropping. As a matter of fact, I said that the, in this country, the low level for men is 40. Guess what it is when the Tara Himara Indians, 25, which will drive the unknowing cardiologist absolutely apoplectic. <laughs> so, you know, don't worry about it, the HDL one. It's the same thing is gonna to happen to your white blood count. Normal mm -hmm. between five and 10,000, you start a plant-based, it may drop down to 3,000. Then everybody gets worried, you're fine. Mm -hmm. So the other question is, will adding a lot of raw cilantro to my whole food, plant-based, no oil, Indian cooked curries help boost nitric oxide? Yeah, it's a green leafy vegetable, it should help. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, 
And uh, one person, uh, Sean, is actually from Newfoundland. He's asking uh, how this plant-based diet can help a 50-year-old female with severe iron deficiency. Well, first of all, a 50 year old, you gotta, what is the basis of the iron deficiency? Mm. Is it, 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 it's probably not having to do with her bone marrow, but is she still having extra menstrual periods? Is she losing blood? I mean, that's to me, you gotta really find out why that, why that deficiency is there. That's yes. the first thing. Absolutely, I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't think immediately about diet. What I think about right away is where's this, uh, where's this iron going? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, this one is, uh, does no oil at all, like have you seen in your experience, does it cause any issues with bones and uh, muscles and joints? If None. people have None. Excellent, None. yeah. And uh, if one follows your guidelines and still have higher than normal LDL, what metrics would you keep track of and at what time uh, do you follow traditional cholesterol treatments? Like somebody following the plant-based eating, but still have the normal than higher LDL. Yeah. What I remember I said a few minutes ago, first of all, you be sure that they're, that they're not eating at restaurants. They don't often very eat out. They're not. Uh, and uh, if, if you have a thousand people, who beautifully follow our program, 100%. There'll be going to be some with a total cholesterol 102, some will be 140, 160, 180, 200, 220. If you're eating the right way, you are building an endothelial fortress, an endothelial fortress. And no number is going to cause heart disease. What causes heart disease is what is passing through your lips every day that is going to injure your endothelial capacity to make nitric oxide. Mm. So build the endothelial fortress. Yes. <laughs> we like these punchlines, Dr. Selstein. <laughs> yeah. So Angie is asking, is it possible to lower cholesterol if you have familial hypercholesterolemia? Yeah, it'll, it'll come down often. Some, some, maybe not as far as you'd like, but, come, but again, what you're doing is you're building an endothelial fortress. Mm -hmm. What happens to the people in Okinawa who have familial hypercholesterolemia? What happens to the people in rural China or Central Africa who have familial hypercholesterolemia or those in Papua Highlands? No heart disease, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. This one uh, is uh, from uh, Keith. Does whole food plant-based diet improve atrial fibrillation? You know, we've not studied that. We've had a number of patients who swear that when they started whole food plant-based nutrition, it was responsible for that. But there's been, uh, we've done no research on that. I'm not gonna say that. If it does have to happen to go away, sure, we'd be happy to take credit for it. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I, I think it's unfair of me to tell you that uh, those are related. Good, good. So last couple, Dr. Esselstein, like the, what, what happens if one is plant-based and has some occasionally uh, some multigrain uh, yeah with uh, with some oil? <laughs> well, then that's the, that's the day you're injuring your endothelial cell. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> yeah. And do you recommend a CT calcium score for a person who's on whole food plant-based nutrition? You can get the, uh, uh, that's an interesting, yeah, uh, it's a little bit of a bit, uh, I think I should take a moment and try to answer that. Sure, yeah. So and I recommend is, yeah, CT yeah. calcium score scan for a person with whole food plant-based, no oil nutrition. When you get a calcium score, and this I learned years ago from uh, Bill Costelli, he was the director for 30 years of the world famous Framingham Heart Study outside of Boston. Costelli said, when a physician orders a calcium score, it, get, it gives you two pieces of information. One, 
if there is calcium, that means the patient has coronary artery disease and there are some of the plaques that are calcified, right? He said it also tells us, although we do not see it, that that patient has a number of non-calcified inflamed plaque, which you do not see. And those are the ones that are somewhat more dangerous. But he said, let's suppose you take a patient who has a baseline calcium score of 440, but they absolutely get it right. And over the next year, they're totally committed to plant -based, whole food plant-based nutrition. Then they have another calcium score. Now it's 550 and the patient is much better off because those previously non-calcified inflamed plaque, as they are losing their inflammation during this year of eating this whole food plant-based nutrition, it is as though the body during this period wants to get in on the act and will deposit some calcium in those previously non-calcified inflamed plaque to hasten along the quelling of that inflammation. And now those plaques are not gonna rupture and they're safe. But the thing to remember is that the, your, so if the doctor doesn't know this and he, gets the, and he sees your score going up while you're on this diet, he doesn't understand it. You're much, much better off. The previously non-calcified inflamed plaque have now been put to bed. Yes. So uh, one more question, Dr. Esselstein. Like it says, I have all the greens and vegetables lightly blended, smoothies sometimes, no fruit. Is that okay? Are better not to blend at all? No, I wouldn't say not blend at all. If he wants to blend every now and then, but I, I you know, it's, you know, if, if we were made to blend our food, we'd have been born with a blender. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a great fan of blending blending because of what it might, it might because what I've learned more and more and more is nothing is as important as fiber and I don't want anything to think to destroy the fiber yeah so Brian says that this guy rocks and he's saying that you rock <laughs> <laughs> so I think we'll uh, we'll uh, you know continue we'll we'll stop questions uh, with that Dr. Assistant. But we do want to ask uh, you know a couple of things from this is from us. Um, like, how do you stay fit and so healthy and so sharp at eighty-seven years young? What's well, your secret? Well, then you haven't met my wife. <laughs> 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 we have met Anne, yeah. <laughs> so she she is an energy uh, bunny, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> like, amazing. So apart from uh, eating plant based, uh, Dr. Sustain, like, what is your physical uh, routine? Like physical fitness, you do regularly. I see a bike in the back. That's it. That's it. Every day. Every day. And how long do you go? Well. You don't want to you don't want to be ridiculous about it, but I usually it's it's about uh, forty five or fifty minutes. Wonderful. It has a undulating course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And then I usually try to hit some uh, hit some weights, maybe, and do some walking. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. And this is our final question. This is something that has been on my uh, mind and chest for a long time. Uh, so what? I mean, you have started. Uh, this journey 30, 35 years ago, uh, right? Like uh, uh, in, you were a gen practicing general surgeon and uh, my, I'm also a practicing general surgeon. Like I was always wondered, like if you were to start like uh, even sooner, like what would you do differently? Like, you know, if you had to, um, if you had to start over again, what what advice do would you give for a younger younger doctors younger physicians who are walking on your path? Well, although I'm, I'm obviously <clears throat> obviously at times uh, I mean the surgery was uh, enjoyable when you were able to really 
help somebody. If I happen to be involved with mostly with thyroid and parathyroid uh, surgery, breast surgery, and uh, although I enjoyed abdominal surgery, but uh, it's you, it's pretty hard, I would think, to do them both both as well as you'd like, and. Uh, I think it's important to have a uh, a focus on the fact that what really is going to turn around the health of so many uh, countries and nations and cultures is when you think about it is truly lifestyle. We we know so much now about how to get people to avoid disease, but it, it's such an embarrassment to me to think that we spend all this money on training, for instance, on, on cardiologists, and they don't do a thing. They're not ever treating the causation of the illness. And I think it's, there is, uh, it's, it's gonna be some tough sledding still, but we've, we've, the data are so clear about how to prevent and reverse uh, the great majority of, of illnesses that, uh, I don't, I don't see how, as much as I like surgery, I don't think there's any comparison into the, 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 the joy that I feel when we take patients who are told they have to have bypass, they're told they have to have stents. They don't have to have it. You can stop their disease. And uh, they are the ones that are empowered to do it. And I don't think, so I don't think there's any question that the, the, the direction we have to go in the future. And this is very challenging for medical schools to, cha to change because the, the pharmaceutical companies are so deeply enshrined and committed and supporting so much of this that medicine is committed to this uh, pathway, which un what unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I think that what is challenging the, the pathway is, is going to be the science and the research. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's not gonna be any question. And we won't, unfortunately, we, from a money standpoint, people won't be able to afford the ridiculous way that health expenditures are coming is just crazy. Mm. Yeah. Well, listen, you guys, it's been great. I've yes, enjoyed. thank you so much, Dr. Stein. And we can't right. thank you enough. And we, yeah. we also thank uh, Anne for uh, yeah. making this possible. We really enjoyed having you.